What if the passage that Cole read in our hearing a few moments ago read this way? The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Period. What if it didn't continue? Or what if it had read, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, and a few of us believe we saw him before that occurred. Wouldn't have the same impact, would it, that the words that were read should have? The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Think with me about verse 3 of this text. To whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by Notice these three words, many infallible proofs, many infallible proofs, infallible. If something is infallible, then it is incapable of failing. It is absolutely certain. And then the word proof suggests the evidence or argument that compels the mind to accept an assertion as true. Overwhelming evidence that compels the mind to accept an assertion as being true. But notice, Luke says that Jesus did not merely show himself alive to his disciples after his resurrection, but he did so with proofs. But not just with proofs, but many proofs. But not just many proofs, but many infallible proofs. And that statement by Luke, given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is fundamental to a dispute that is ongoing even to this day, even to this moment in time. And that is a dispute between believers and unbelievers. Believe the friend, between the friends of the Bible and the enemies of the Bible. And it is a dispute that involves the very foundation of God's revelation to man as to whether or not this truly is God's revelation to man. You see, if Luke's statement is true, the Bible is true, and thus from God, with all the consequences that follow. If Jesus showed himself alive after his sufferings by many infallible proofs, then he rose from the dead. An imposter could not have raised himself from the dead. And God certainly would not have raised an imposter from the dead. So if Jesus rose, then God raised him. And he's divine. And if he is divine, then all that he ever said is true. And that becomes the foundation of the entire matter of God's revelation to man. The two stand or fall together. His resurrection and his revelation. And we began this morning a study of miracles in our Bible classes. And it would not make one ounce of difference in our lives if indeed Jesus indeed did all the miracles about which we will be studying. But on the last count, being raised from the dead, he did not rise. No matter how he performed all the miracles about which we will be studying this quarter, even if he were able to do them validly without magic or some sort of trick like Simon the Sorcerer did for a long time before he learned the truth and saw the real power of the Holy Spirit, even if Jesus did it one way or another, if he did them validly, if he was truly a man of God, a prophet of God with miraculous ability, he promised to rise from the dead, and if he failed in that final promise, then all else means nothing in terms of our eternal salvation. We could have slept in this morning. 
we could have hit the road early for Fourth of July vacation. We can close the doors if indeed it cannot be proved that Jesus rose from the dead. It's an issue of vital importance, and it's an issue that is not about opinion, it's not about speculation, it's not about some theory, but about a person, about the most wonderful person who ever lived on this earth. And the question about that person is, did this person rise from the dead? First of all, think with me about the two parties involved in this issue. We've mentioned them, the believers and the unbelievers. What do the unbelievers claim? Nothing. They claim nothing. They affirm nothing. They advocate nothing. They defend absolutely nothing. They deny Christ. They deny the apostles. They deny the prophets, on and on. And in their place, they propose nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing to offer you but doubts instead of faith, confusion instead of confidence and conviction, paganism instead of peace with God. That's what they offer. But to approach the question intelligently, we need to see what even the unbelievers admit. You see, even the unbelievers will admit certain things that simply cannot be denied. First of all, that there was such a person as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, there have been a few people who in times past, and perhaps even today, have tried to deny the historicity of Jesus, that he ever lived, that he was simply just a myth. But that's absolutely ridiculous to any right-thinking person, even any unbeliever who is accountable, <laughs> we should say. They should understand that there's too much evidence too much evidence, external evidence, outside of Scripture for the fact that Jesus lived. Also, that he lived at the time assigned to him in the Bible. That's established. Also, that he lived in the country assigned to him in the Bible. That's established. Also, that he was nailed to a Roman cross. That's established. That he actually died on that cross. That the body was given to Joseph of Arimathea that Joseph laid that body in his own new tomb, that a great stone was placed at the entrance of the tomb, and that an armed guard of Roman soldiers was stationed over it to guard it, and that the directions given those who posted that guard were there, Pilate said, make it as secure as you can, or the words that were given, make it as secure as you can, as Pilate gave them permission to do that. Also, what's denied is that the reason for posting the guard was that the enemies remembered something. They remembered that Jesus had said, I will rise the third day. And so they were afraid that the disciples would steal the body of Jesus and tell that he had risen from the dead. And here's one other undeniable fact, even for the unbelievers that early on the morning of the third day, something had happened to that body. It was missing. All of those things are admitted by even the unbelievers. So specifically, what do the unbelievers claim happened to the body of Jesus? Well, they say that it was stolen. And who were the witnesses? The witnesses were the Roman soldiers it is said that there would have been 16 of them making up that Roman guard. And where were those 16 Roman soldiers when the body was stolen? They were right there. They were at their post, and what were they doing? They were sleeping. Sleeping. That was the word. They were sleeping. That's what they were told to say. Once it was evident that the body had left the tomb. If they were asleep, how did they know anyone, let alone the disciples of Jesus, stole the body? And why were they never prosecuted for being asleep on duty? They never were. A crime punishable by Roman law. You remember what Herod did 
to 16, all 16 of the guards after Peter had escaped from prison miraculously as the angels freed him, he had every one of them killed. I've read that the method that was used, at least in many cases, was they were beaten and then burned in their own clothing. And that if one of those Roman guards went to sleep, just one and all other 15 stayed awake, they would all be killed. You remember the Philippian jailer and what he initially feared when he knew the doors of the prison there at Philippi had been opened. He was about to kill himself because he knew that he had let them escape, he thought, and that the Romans would take his life. But these soldiers were never prosecuted. The record gives us no indication that they were ever prosecuted under Roman law. And why did no one ever confront the disciples of Christ and compel them to return the body? The reason is they did not believe their own story because it was all made up. So what motive could the disciples have had for stealing the body? If indeed that was a plausible accusation, what would have been the motive of the disciples of Christ to steal the body of the Lord because they thought they could make it alive again. Of course not. They did not believe they could make it alive again. In fact, Scripture tells us they did not even understand the resurrection at this point. They did not believe that Jesus would rise from the dead. They had a lot to be enlightened about and to learn about. And even after the resurrection, as they stood before the risen Lord, they asked him what? Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Meaning what? Will you become our king and overthrow the Roman government? In other words, at that point in time, they still had a physical, earthly kingdom in their mind. And Jesus just simply said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that God has in his hand. In other words, he was just saying in effect to them, all that's going to be revealed, and you're all ultimately going to get it and understand it. But they didn't even understand the resurrection in terms of its significance at that point in time. And so this whole report that someone, the, the disciples mainly, had stolen the body of Jesus was absolutely impossible to believe. But now notice the other side. How do the friends of Jesus how did the friends of Jesus account for the absence of his body from the tomb on the morning of the third day? They claim he rose from the dead. But who are their witnesses? Well, Paul tells us that he was seen alive after the resurrection by Cephas. That's Peter, of course. He was seen by the twelve those apostles who were the apostles at that time. Afterward, he was seen by more than 500 brethren at once. More than 500 brethren at once, the greater portion of whom were still living when Paul wrote these words to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And after that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And last of all, as one born out of due time, he was seen by Paul on the Damascus Road. That's quite an array of witnesses, isn't it? One group being more than 500 at one time. How are you going to make that testimony doubtful? If your purpose is to try to cast doubt upon that testimony that we've just cited, how do you do it? You can only do it in two ways. One is, if it can be shown that the witnesses were mistaken, if they just simply thought they saw Jesus, that they were mistaken. The only other possibility is to show that the honesty of the witnesses is in question. They were dishonest about what they said, and that would render the testimony doubtful. So on the first point, Let's ask, could the witnesses have been mistaken? The answer is clearly, to any honest mind, no. There's no possibility of their being mistaken. He was seen on too many occasions by too many people for them to have been mistaken. 
And then the apostles themselves saw him ascend to heaven and heard the angels speak to them on that occasion and to tell them, as you've seen him go, you'll see him come again. So there were just too many occasions and too many witnesses for them to have been mistaken. And then the later the apostles claimed that he gave them power to heal and to preach by inspiration. And some of the witnesses made statements that it could have easily been proven false by any number of people. Think about that. What about Matthew's account of the miracles that he records, which we'll be studying this quarter, some of them? Could they have been challenged if Matthew had been mistaken? Matthew writes about the Lord feeding thousands of people in open day. You think there was anyone around at that time, any number of people who could have challenged that account as Matthew wrote maybe some eight years after the resurrection when he penned his gospel account by inspiration? Was anyone still around who could have said, Matthew, it's obvious that never happened. <laughs> that man, Jesus, never fed thousands of people in open day. What about the great earthquake and the darkness that occurred at the Lord's crucifixion that Matthew records? Could that have been challenged by anyone who easily could have been there on that occasion? Well, of course they could and would have. They would have challenged it. And why wouldn't they? Because Jesus was not in an atmosphere where the vast majority of people were looking to accept him as the Messiah. Many did, but far more did not. He had far more enemies than he had friends who would have been eager and ready to counter Matthew's writings or any other writings of the apostles and other inspired men. The apostles claimed to be able to speak in languages they had never learned, to make revelations by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Were they mistaken about all that? Of course not. But dishonesty, is that a possibility? Could, could these witnesses have been dishonest? They had no incentive whatsoever for telling falsehoods about the resurrection. When someone tells a falsehood, generally there's some incentive for so doing, some advantage that they're going to gain, some punishment they're going to avoid, some benefit they're going to receive, some good reason, some valid incentive for telling a lie. There's no good reason for telling a lie, obviously, but many can justify that. They need some benefit they can see. No incentive whatsoever for falsehoods about the resurrection. You see, the resurrection story, if it is not true, was the most unpopular and unwelcome story that any man or set of men could have ever told at the time in which they lived. You couldn't have picked a more unpopular story to tell than that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That's not going to gain you friends. That's not going to garner for you any benefits whatsoever. And you think about the nature of these apostles before the resurrection. Did they have weaknesses? Were they somewhat at times timid and cowardly? What about Peter in denying the Lord three times as he was on trial? What about in the Garden of Gethsemane where all of them fled from him when he was taken prisoner? Now then we're to think, okay, these timid and cowardly men as they were before the death of Christ, suddenly now, even though they've stolen the body and they know the resurrection is a falsehood, they now have the courage to stand up one time, even one time, and claim Jesus rose from the dead knowing full well that it's untrue. How do you account for their even doing it one time? But beyond that, how do you account for their persistence in proclaiming the resurrected Christ until their testimony was sealed with their own blood? How in the world do you account for that on the basis of dishonesty? 
I will die for a dishonest claim. Makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. You think about Paul, for example. J.W. McGarvey, the great restoration scholar, said that Paul is one of the great proofs of the resurrection of Jesus because of what he saw, what he didn't see, and what he sacrificed. What he saw on the Damascus Road, whom he saw more accurately, Jesus. Then what he didn't see because he was what? Struck blind for three days. And then what he sacrificed after he got his sight back, became a Christian and an apostle. And was ultimately, tradition says, beheaded because of all of that. Who can believe that it was dishonesty that motivated him? to suffer all of that. You look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 in reference to the Apostle Paul and then doubt if you can that Paul was an honest man. In verse 23 he asks, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. You read that and then tell me that Paul was a dishonest man when it comes to what he saw on the Damascus Road. And then you notice the first preaching of the apostles. Where was that done? Well, if they had stolen the body, one might suspect they'd go about as far away from Jerusalem as they possibly could to do their first preaching. Wouldn't you? But it was right there in Jerusalem. The first preaching was done right in Jerusalem where 50 days before that it was unanimously agreed Jesus died. This was the very place where people were better prepared than anywhere on earth to judge the truth of that preaching. And the prejudices of the people were against the apostles as well as popularity and all other worldly interests. All existing religion of that day was against them. And what was the result? Some 3,000 souls obeyed the gospel. And in a few days, 5,000 had become obedient to the faith. Shortly, the gospel reached Samaria. And then it moved onward from there. And in less than 40 years, truth traveled the length of the Mediterranean Sea and throughout the world. Are we to believe that illiterate, timid, uninspired fishermen and others like them did all of this on their own strength? Did they do it by preaching a falsehood and in their mere human strength perpetuating a falsehood? A falsehood, if it's a falsehood, that has produced more than any truth had ever produced since the beginning of time. More has been produced from that falsehood, if it's a falsehood, than anything that's true has produced since the beginning of time. How could that be? The Restoration preacher Ben Franklin, not Benjamin Franklin, statesman, but Ben Franklin, gospel preacher, put it this way. He said, quote, To say that the apostles did this in their own strength by preaching a falsehood, and one of the silliest falsehoods ever told, too, if it was a falsehood at all, is to say that the most stupendous, grand, and sublime religious movement recorded in the world's history was achieved by weak and ignorant men by preaching a falsehood in spite of all the learning, talent, Money, prejudice, pride, popularity, civil and religious authorities on the face of the earth. And then he adds, the man who will say this is not a subject of argument. <laughs> and
and where are the names of all the great men of that day who no doubt thought Christianity would never last? That day and after that day, the French philosopher Voltaire claimed that a hundred years from his day, Christianity would be wiped from the face of the earth. And it was said that his house in which he lived, maybe died, became a distribution point for the Bible. Now, what about the name of Jesus of Nazareth? Every unbeliever who writes a letter in some form or another puts down, in effect, the year of our Lord, 2017. And in the midst of the unbelief, the hardness of heart, the impenitence of our times, and we have it in our time, the name of Jesus still finds its way into all the records, legal documents, and the entire literature of the civilized world. And for one who thinks the power of Christ is nothing, let him consider this day, the origin of this day. What is it called? The Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. The observance of the first day of the week. And how many times do you ever see faith in Christ give way when death is imminent? Is that the time when most Christians give up their faith? Oh, no. And in fact, on the other hand, many infidels have repudiated their unbelief when dying. I love, well, again, what Ben Franklin said. He wrote, in the last moments of life, that is, there is a great difference between one who can say, the Lord is my shepherd, and the one who says, there is no God. Vast difference between the one who says, the Lord is my shepherd, and the one who says, there is no God. But quickly, how does the resurrection of Christ show the Bible to be of divine authority? Well, the resurrection proves Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that becomes the foundation for the divine authority of the Bible. If Jesus is the Christ, his claims are established, all they'd ever taught is true, but how does this confirm the divine authority of the Bible? Three ways. He fulfilled numerous predictions of the Old Testament, did he not? Which could not have been fulfilled by an imposter. And so he confirmed the divine authority of all those prophets who wrote about him. And in so doing, he confirmed his divine authority. He confirmed their authority when he fulfilled the prophecies and he confirmed his own divine authority. And after he had established his own divine authority, he called and qualified and he sent the apostles and confirmed their divine mission. And so he endorsed them and the portions of scripture that they wrote. Jesus endorses all that they said, all that they did. And that settles the divine authority of the New Testament. It's settled. And since the claims of Jesus are established, all of his acts and words are of divine authority. Therefore, he was with God before the world was. It was by him and for him that the worlds were made. He was before all things, and by him all things consist. To summarize it, he knew all things, all authority was vested in him, and all that he endorsed is of divine authority. What did he endorse? He endorsed the divine authority of the Old Testament. How many times did he speak about Moses and others in the Old Testament? Jonah the prophet. He endorsed the Old Testament. He endorsed the work of the apostles and the other inspired writers of the New Testament. He endorsed the work they did, the wonders they achieved, and he endorsed the religious revolution that they produced. Again, Ben Franklin, the gospel preacher, put it this way. What a grand spectacle to see him of whom Moses and all the prophets wrote, who was dead and is alive, who is divine, who has all authority in heaven and on earth, in whom all the fullness of the deity resides fully, to see him, he says, standing between the two testaments, the old and the new, extending one hand back over Moses and the prophets, fully endorsing the Old Testament as of divine authority, and then turning to the apostles and extending the other hand over them. And by 
endorsing them and accompanying them with the most grand and stupendous displays of supernatural power, endorsing the New Testament given by them as of divine authority. Standing between the Testaments, Franklin says, endorsing the old and endorsing the new. Therefore, it's all of divine authority. The question is settled. The Bible is of divine authority because it is all endorsed by him who is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And therefore, his plan of salvation is of divine authority. And that plan of salvation, which must be obeyed if we're to have any hope whatsoever of being with him for eternity in a heavenly bliss that is beyond the ability of the finite mind to fully appreciate and comprehend, then we must accept that divine plan. Hear it. It is right here. Believe it. Believe that he is the one he claimed to be. Unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins, John 8, 24. Repent or perish, Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, and again at verse 5. Confess me before men, and I'll confess you before the Father in heaven, Matthew 10, 32. Deny me, and I'll deny you, verse 33 adds. And then Jesus put it so clearly when he gave the culminating act of obedient faith by which we gain entrance into the kingdom and are saved by his cleansing blood when he said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's the divine plan given by divine authority, endorsed by the one who proved himself to be who he claimed to be by his resurrection from the dead, by many infallible proofs. The only question that remains is, will you obey what he has taught in becoming his child? And if you haven't done that, we plead with you to do it now because there may not be another opportunity. By the same token, there may not be another opportunity for those who need to come home to their first love to do so. And to do that, the second law of pardon that is clearly authorized in Scripture is repent and confess as publicly as sin has been committed the sins before your brothers and sisters in Christ and to the God of heaven. And ask us, your brothers and sisters in Christ, to pray with you and for you, which we will gladly and eagerly do as we all pray together to the Father who will gladly and most eagerly forgive and forget all the sin that's against you. That's what we're promised by the book divinely endorsed by the one who proved himself to be the only begotten Son of God. Will you come as we stand to sing to encourage? Jesus is tenderly.